Selatan. Apa khabar? Very good afternoon. Hello to all spectators and participants of Common IPG KPA 2020. I hope everyone is healthy and energetic to continue following the virtual colloquium, which is a program designed specifically for educators and MTCP alumni from around the world. To all Common IPG KBA 2020 participants, for today's session, we are excited uh, to introduce our speaker from the United Kingdom. As a gentle reminder also for today, with the COVID-19 pandemic still is still uh, widespread around the globe, I would like to remind all of our, our audience to always maintain personal safety and adhering to physical distancing measures at all times, and please take every opportunity to regularly wash and sanitize your hand. Remember to stay safe and always adhere to the SOP set according to your respective countries. Hashtag stay safe and world peace. And also thank you to all participants who have continued to be with us throughout the IPGKBA International and then Domestic Virtual Colloquium or Common IPGKBA for the year 2020. To all participants, especially educators under the Ministry of Education Malaysia, Please ensure that you register through the SPLKM, SPLKPM website for the record of attendance and uh, participation in Common IPGKPA 2020. And to the other participants from all over Malaysia and the rest of the world who are also watching Common IPGKPA 2020 today, I would like to remind you to confirm your attendance via the link provided. To our viewers, make sure you get the latest information related to the session offered by Common IPGK BA 2020 via our Facebook. And you're also welcome to leave any suggestions or comments to help us further enhance the quality of this Common IPGK BA program in the future. Well, today's today's session will be moderated by Mr. S. Mukti, who is a senior lecturer from IPGK BA. Over to you, Mr. Mukti. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Gauss. Good afternoon from Malaysia, and uh, welcome back to the Virtual Colloquium 2020, organized by the Department of Planning, Innovation, and Research from the Institute of Teacher Education, International Languages Campus, Malaysia, or otherwise known as IPG KBA. And I'm Multi, your moderator for today's presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, before we proceed, allow me to briefly explain to you the format. Now the speaker will present for about 45 minutes, and this will be followed by a question and answer session with the audience. If you have a question for the speaker, please feel free to post in the chat box. The speaker will answer your questions at the end of the session. Now, if we do not get to your questions during today's webinar, we will follow up later. And lastly, we encourage you to share today's webinar with your social networks. Now, ladies and gentlemen, allow me now to introduce you to our presenter for today, Professor Alistair Irons. Now, Professor Alistair Irons is Professor of Computer Science and Academic Dean for the Faculty of Technology at the University of Sunderland. He has worked in higher education since the early 90s after spending seven years in industry following graduation. His research interests focus on digital forensics and cyber security. His presentation today is entitled Educational Leadership and Value for Money for Students. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, please welcome Professor Alistair Irons. Thank you very much, Amuthi. I, I've Thank you very much for that very kind introduction uh, and a very warm welcome from from the uk uh, good afternoon to you it's it's good morning from me um at uh, 
uh, as I'm delighted and privileged uh, to to be with with you today, uh, and thank you so much for 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 the invitation. So, with all all due protocols uh, uh, observed, uh, I'd like to take you through my my presentation on educational leadership and, and value for for money for students. Um, <laughs> Unfortunately, we are in the, the situation we're in with, with COVID-19, as, as colleagues have already, already mentioned, and, and we are observing very strange circumstances. Uh, and some of my, my presentation will, of course, allude to those changes in leadership uh, as we, we deal with the, uh, the, the, the situation in, in higher education. And of course, it, uh, as students come back to, to, to study, we, the, the question around value for money uh, becomes even more pertinent given that they will have a, a different experience uh, to the one that they, they probably would have been thinking about at, the, at this time last year when they were considering coming into the, the next stages of, of education. So my talk today uh, is to, to look at some of the, the changes in education pre-COVID-19 um, as well as what was happening before this this horrible situation look at what's happened as a result as we we deal we respond to the to, to the to the environment but then also to pick out a number of the lessons that that have been learned as we've dealt with the 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 horrible horrible situation indeed as a precursor to some of what I'm, I'm going to say some of the changes that have been forced upon us are the very changes that a number of us in, in educational leadership have been advocating and trying to pursue for a, for a number of years. So that is part of the, 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 the mix as we, we look at the, the environment that we find ourselves in. Of course, education is open to all and uh, the, the, you know, from, from everyone from uh, you know, the, the leaving school right through to after they've retired, there's no, there's no time to stop education. But we, we tend to focus as our major customers on the, the, the 18 to 24 group um, the, you know, as, and 80, 85 percent of our, our, our students are in that, that, that bracket. So with that age range, there are a number of, of expectations. These are our young people who have been born this century, who have been digital natives right from the right from the outset they have uh, very different views and expectations uh, around life around technology uh, and around education and i hope to cover some of that in my, my discussion this, this morning this afternoon the uh, educational leadership is obviously important to to many of you who are uh, listening and participating later with so, so, some questions uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about my experience um, in, in higher education, but also drawing on some of the, the lessons that I've learned um, from my subject discipline, uh, particularly in, in cybersecurity. Because in, in many ways, uh, dealing with cybersecurity and leading in cybersecurity is like leading in, in higher education, um, particularly in times of crisis um, when we've got a, a whole set of risks being thrown at us. And of course, uh, as we, we talked about uh, in the, the the prelude to the to the talk, the, um, the the value for money and what that means for those investing in education, um, we are all challenged in the, these times around uh, enrolling students and recruiting students. We're all challenged in dealing with the the different forms of of delivery, which are potentially much more expensive. Um, but then it goes back to the expectation of the, the the digital natives, and and we can't do this kind of thing. Uh, uh, do do a record a lecture and, and put it on, on YouTube and expect that to be the only thing that that students uh, will will want. We have to have almost Hollywood quality uh, uh, output uh, for to to meet their, their their expectations, which is a big challenge for us. Colleagues very kindly inter introduced me and, and just a little bit about my 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 background. Um, as we've said, I'm academic dean for the Faculty of Technology at the University of Sunderland, where I have two schools: the School of Computer Science uh, and the School of of Engineering. We have 
and nearly a thousand students on, on campus in, in Sunderland, undergraduate and postgraduate. But we have centers all, all over the world where we, we collaborate. Indeed, we have centers in, in Malaysia, uh, and it's been my great privilege to visit Kuala Lumpur uh, a number of times uh, over the, the, the recent years. And I've always had a, a wonderful time there and been made to, to feel most welcome. So I hope that I can reciprocate. And when all this madness stops, uh, encourage you to come and visit us in the UK and particularly in, in Sunderland. For my sins, I'm a professor of computer science um, and that's my, where my subject matter lies. I'm not, I was a national teaching fellow, I was awarded national teaching fellow status in, in 2010. I'm currently vice president of the, the British Computer Society, the Chartered Institute for IT, um, where I, I chair the academy board. Um, in my institution at the University of Sunderland, I'm, I'm the lead for the, the Institute of Coding Project and the Sustainable Advanced, Manu Man uh, Ma Advanced Manufacturing Project. Um, showing my links with Malaysia, uh, currently I'm honorary advisor to, to Mimo Segi Centre of, of Excellence in, in AI, and I'm delighted to, to take on that, that post. Um, I'm also a senior research fellow at the University of Johannesburg in South Africa. I've previously been a, a visiting scholar at the University of, of Cape Town in South Africa. Um, so I have a, 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 wild, a, a wide global interest in, in, in education. Um, my subject specialisms and pu publications conference papers, which you can, you can dip into and look at, are in digital forensics and, and cyber security, as well as in, in, in pedagogy. And, uh, um, my, my, my main areas of publication uh, recently in the, in the last year or so have been around accreditation and professional accreditation of, of uh, higher education programs and promoting that and, and reviewing that. Uh, and also in the development of uh, computer science academics um, and particularly looking at how we, we mentor academics, new academics in their, at the start of their career. So enough about me. A little bit about Sunderland. I, I hope you can see this photograph. It, uh, it perhaps doesn't come up very, very, very well. I don't know if I've got my oh my mouse is working. So this this the part of the photograph here is, is actually a river. This is the River Weir, and here we have uh, two ships being built, uh, and this is the St Peter's Shipyard at, at Sunderland. Um, Sunderland has, was made a city re relatively recently. Um, within the last 20 years um, but before that it was a town and at one point uh, earlier in the, the, the last century Sunderland was the largest shipbuilding town in the world um, so we, we like to to build on this tradition of innovation of leadership of uh, manufacturing of uh, getting products to uh, the the, uh, the the to to market, and that has shaped uh, the, the the cultural position that I, I find myself in in Sunderland. So enough history. Um, if I show you the uh, this photograph, the same river here. This is the River Weir, um, and do you, I don't know if you can see my mouse. I hope you can. But going from the the, the green part in the left to the, the 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 sort of brick red part in the middle is where those two ships were being built. And here is my building. This is the the David Goldman Informatics Centre where we uh, give our, do our computer science and and engineering education. And just in there is is my office. So my office sits at the the tail end of where that ship was being being built. So my, my, the historical traditions of um, manufacturing and industry and information and innovation live on in our in our university. So um, moving on to the, today's um, today's talk and and the concepts of of leadership. Um, as we've indicated earlier, I'm currently dean for the faculty of of technology. Um, so there's a leadership role in that. Um, and the, the, the faculty is one of five faculties in, in the university um, uh, and the faculties are obviously the income generating side of, of, of the university. So uh, I lead my faculty, I have two heads of school um, and uh, a senior management team um, that, that manages the education, the quality, the, the finances uh, of, the, of, of the faculty. I also sit on the senior leadership board for the university 
um, which means that I, I have the opportunity to to work at strategic and operational level uh, across the university um, as well as my faculty. In fact, uh, I am taking on uh, a new university role, which leads into some of what I'm talking about today around digital education um, and marrying the, the technology with the pedagogic opportunities around uh, COVID-19. COVID um, and my new role, my extended role, is, is really coming out because of the need to change rapidly um, and to lead that change in, in a constructive and, and positive way. As I mentioned, I'm, I'm vice president for the academic, uh, vice president academic for the, the professional body in the computing in the UK, which really allows me to engage in leadership activities at a different level and in a different way. Um, the uh, whilst the university has twenty thousand uh, students, and it's a, a really interesting to be in, involved in that. The the professional body has over seventy thousand members, and being uh, in a position to to work with with colleagues in leading that learned society is a is a, a great privilege uh, and uh, something that I, I particularly enjoy. Um, in my the past, I've been a, a associate dean for learning and teaching, um, which has given me the opportunity to to think very carefully about how students learn um, and and what the student experience is like, and has led to my philosophy. Uh, really around everything that I do in higher education about putting the students first, putting everything that, that I do in higher education to be centred on student activity. So I have a, a range of different um, leadership experiences uh, and you, having students front and centre is, is so important and so key to, to everything I, I believe about education. But my experiences have, have uh, enabled me to develop uh, a, a portfolio of managing change about dealing with how uh, there is resistance to change you know and, and often change is seen as a threat and a worry for for uh, people for colleagues for students um, and and thinking about how we, we emphasize the positive I've always tried to to provide authentic leadership and there's a, a, a very good and, and wide literature on authentic leadership and that, that's something that I I would advocate and, and promote and I also like to think that I'm a, a, an advocate and ambassador for equality and, and cl inclusivity making sure that everyone is treated equally whether they're customers whether they're students whether they're parents whether they're colleagues whether they're academics across the piece uh, is really really important to me Going sideways a little bit uh, and talking about cybersecurity uh, as one of my my discipline areas of of interest and and I dare say expertise, uh, if I may, <laughs> may may be immodest. Um, cybersecurity is a, a, a fascinating area to 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 be in, um, and often uh, we we deal with really really interesting challenges. And that most people don't want to think about cybersecurity, don't want to pay for cybersecurity see the value for money bit coming in there until something goes wrong and all of a sudden when uh, there's an attack or whether when things fall over when there's a, a a breach or where people lose data or whatever it might be cyber security becomes really really central so working in that environment and learning from that environment has been really really interesting to 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 tease out uh key skills, transitional skills uh, that I, I've taken into my educational leadership. So thinking about identifying risks and being very proactive in what it is that I've been doing. So getting, get, it goes back to my sporting days um, and I was never a very good uh, footballer or, or rugby player, um, but I always like to get my retaliation in first. Um, uh, for those of you who play football or, or rugby will understand that. Uh, later on in my life, I, I took up uh, karate um, and I carried that that philosophy into my karate fighting, um, which was got me into slight uh, uh, trouble, but was also something that made me feel comfortable. Identifying the risks, knowing the risks, and doing something about it in advance is is really really important. Evaluating those risks and thinking about what might happen in, in terms of of 
a risk to to uh, operation and what might interrupt that operation has been important. Then the two really uh, important things to 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 bring out, um, particularly when we start to look at uh, leadership and education and, and value for money, is communication and key and clear communication to everybody. The most frustrating thing for people is when things are are hidden, are, are unknown. Um, or, or, or are not particularly uh, well articulated. And then thinking about how we do things in a timely manner. There's no point in identifying a risk and sitting on it and not doing anything about it. So hopefully you can see from the, 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 the that very, very brief oversight into cybersecurity and indeed to my sporting past that uh, there are parallels in, in leading in higher education and in, in, in all forms of education. Um, but also in parallels and ensuring value for, for money. So thinking about uh, what we, we, we're trying to, to, to achieve, we're talking about leadership in higher education. What, what, why, why do we need higher education leaders? Why don't we just get in there and do it? Um, a very interesting question. And indeed, there's a, there's a, I'm sure there's a couple of PhDs in, in looking at, at that. But leadership in, in higher education is, a, is about maintaining and, and enhancing academic ex excellence and, and rigor um, really really important that we push at the forefront of knowledge we continue to expand the body of knowledge we continue to think about uh, how we do things in education as i mentioned it's uh, about student experience and ensuring that uh, all students uh, from whichever background from whichever age group um, are able to access and get the benefits from, from education. It's important that we encourage research. Often in times of crisis, um, as we find ourselves now, we look at, at how to, to cut costs to ensure value for money. Um, and an easy target may well be to look at the, the, the spend that we have on research. Um, I would argue that that's, that's counterproductive and we need to maintain the investment in, in, in research and ensure that our research uh, continues in these difficult times. Anyone who's involved in leadership in the higher education or in any form of education know that there are, are many stakeholders um, across a very, very broad community um, with very, very different motivations. And this can make it you know, particularly difficult um, to, to be a leader in, in, in higher education as you're being pulled in all sorts of different directions from different stakeholders who want different things uh, from you. There are, uh, a, a, as a leader in higher education, there is an academic responsibility to ensure the uh, well-being of the, the academy, of the faculty, um, of teachers, of lecturers, of uh, all the, the, the academic community. Um, and it ranges from that the health and well-being, as, as colleagues have talked about this morning, and ensuring that people are, are safe in, in the jobs to making sure that they have the environment uh, to to carry out the, the work that they're expected to do. We also have a, a civic and societal responsibility. Um, in my institution, I, I, we're very fortunate in that there's one university in, uh, in, in the city, um, which means that we work very closely with the uh, local councils, the local uh, uh, po politicians, the local uh, industry the local business uh, and and it's really nice to look at that that sort of microcosm of civic and societal responsibility but as we then think about our, our, our disciplines uh, and and what that broader uh, responsibility is so in, in cyber security and digital forensics um uh, again i'm very privileged to be involved in that 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 broader uh, strategic development of those, those 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 subjects and how they're implemented and how they the the uh, the the manifest themselves. So it's a real balancing act. Um, being a leader in higher education is uh, it, it's great fun. Uh, there's no denying it. There's there are many challenges. It can be very frustrating. It can be very stressful. Um, but uh, that that balancing act of getting all of these the different. Uh, uh, parts in, in, in place is, is, a, is a fascinating uh, challenge that gets me gets me up in the morning um, uh, and, and, and really focuses my, my professional professional life. 
So looking after staff and students and thinking about the workload and capacity and all the things that they're doing um, starts to lead us into the, the concepts of value for, for, for money. As one might expect, um, with my background uh, and indeed from from my faculty, technology can be be used and, and utilised to to help uh, our, our leadership in, in higher education. Um, I'm not an advocate for replacing leaders in higher education uh, by by technology. Uh, could we have a, an artificial uh, uh, intelligence dean, uh, and would they do a better job than me? <laughs> quite possibly, quite probably. Um, but I'm slightly worried uh, about uh, having uh, you know complete uh, control handed over handed over to technology. That may well come in in the future. Hopefully, after I've retired. Um, but certainly, in in, in today's world, um, we can use a technology to enhance the work that we're doing to enhance our, our leadership. As we move towards education 4.0, um, the, the, there are so many things that we can we can use and, and, and utilize. And I've included a few here. So there's opportunities with with technology to look at uh, in inclusion and, and, and equality. One of the things that has become apparent uh, as we deal with COVID-19 and, and ensuring that all students have access to um, the, the, the resources that they need, that there are technical inequalities um, in, in uh, both access to, to equipment, uh, access to infrastructure, but also around digital fluency, digital literacy and the like. And things that you know, perhaps I had taken for, for, for granted have come to the, to the fore and have shaped the way that uh, I've been involved uh, in, in dealing with, uh, with things as, a, as an academic leader. Data analytics is uh, something that's been around for a while, um, but as data science and the tools and techniques of, of data science grow and evolve, there are, we can get access to much more information uh, which can help us as, as leaders. And of course, there's the learning analytics aspect from students um, and we can learn more about our students. We can learn about our, uh, our students' behavior. We can learn about student engagement and we can use the technology to identify problems uh, before they, they exist. Sometimes we can identify a pattern for, for, for a student problem before a student knows there's a problem, which I think is a fantastic thing that we, we can do. And indeed, it's part of the, the value added that, that uh, higher education institutions can bring to, to the table. There are also a whole lot of opportunities around the smart campus. Um, as we go into uh, my, my, my institution has been in lockdown since and since March, but as we start to to reopen the, the 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 buildings, we're using technology to to monitor who's in the building. We're using technology to uh, invoke track and trace uh, if uh, that is re re required. But they are only small examples of the the smart campus and and putting the technology in place can really enhance the experience for our students and can be uh, a key aspect of, of, of added value. So that students can access materials, students can access the learning when it suits them best. They can attend uh, for group discussions and, and meet tutors and meet colleagues and peers when it suits them best. Um, so there's some real, real opportunities for us, for us there. Um, and then we get to to an interesting space and and and, and, and using uh, technology and leadership. And where are we going to do that? Are we going to do it at module level, unit level, where there's a, a teacher talking with a with a group of students? Are we going to do it for a school and and have a strategy for a school? Do we do it at faculty level, um, or is it a, a central university uh, type thing where where every every student has the same experience? Um, and those are things that I'm 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 dealing with at, at, at the moment as I move into my 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 role uh, uh, looking at, at, at digital education. Are there different expectations between different subjects? Is there so, is there a difference between somebody who is studying languages to somebody who's studying engineering? Is there differences between somebody who's studying geography to somebody who's studying computer science? And they are the you know, interesting uh, challenges uh, for 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 the future uh, in leadership. So leading through COVID-19, um, you know, the world kind of turned on its head the, the, this year. Um, you know, I, I was at, at this very point last year, 
I was on my my way to Malaysia to come and 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 and, and give a talk at the the new Segi University. Um, I, I I just had no concept or no notion that we would find ourselves in this situation. We hadn't learned the lessons from SARS. We hadn't learned the the lessons from the uh, the the. the issues in Sierra Leone a few few years ago. Indeed, Bill Gates did warn us and and said that, you know, we, sh we should be thinking about how to deal with with pandemics and uh, we should be thinking about how to to, to do to 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 manage our way through things. But of course, I, then I hadn't spotted that as a risk. I'm, I'm sure the vast majority of us hadn't thought of it as a as a as a risk. So we found ourselves in, in March uh, in, in the UK might have been slightly earlier in in uh, Malaysia and in the, in the Philippines, um, but uh, we we got this situation where we went into lockdown, and so um, we had a, a a kind of a firefight. So what on earth are we going to do? We we're very fortunate in that it was getting towards the end of semester two, so an awful lot of the the teaching for our academic year had happened already, um, and it was the tail end of teaching and a lot of assessment. That was being dealt with in that lockdown down period, so we were able to 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 put in a, a, an immediate call, call to arms to to ensure that we were doing business um, as uh, to uh, as as close to what we had been doing previously as, as possible. We put in a, a a number of rapid solutions to to problems. We used our virtual learning environments. We used. Uh, our, our existing blending learning. Um, we, we used the infrastructure that we, we, we had in place um, to ensure that students could get access to materials, could get access to tutors. We were very, very fortunate in that we had just moved to a, a new platform which enabled us to do uh, video conferencing. If we hadn't done that um, in January, you know, I, I, I hesitate to think where we, we, we would have been. Um, you might remember um, in, in, in March, April time, there were a whole series of cybersecurity challenges around the, the use of, of some platforms. As a cybersecurity professional, it was really interesting to be involved in that and, and, and to look at that. Anyway, I, 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 I digress. There were a number of principles that, that we, we put in, in place, and it goes back to the, 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 the concept that I talked about earlier about putting students first and, and, and foremost. And that was to have no detriment to students. Um, and it meant that um, whatever the circumstances, if the student fell ill or a student's family fell ill um, or they couldn't get access to, to what it was that they were, uh, they needed to get access to because of technical issues. If they, they couldn't uh, undertake the learning, then we would put provision in place to ensure that they weren't uh, d disadvantaged. Um, and that has been a, a really interesting uh, process to to put in place. Um, we, as with most universities in, in, in the UK, put in place emergency regulations uh, to to deal with uh, the uh, assessment board uh, process, and those have worked uh, reasonably well. Um, in fact, we're just at that put the, the tie up pace as we go through the referral uh, phase at the minute, and we're in the, 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 the midst of exam boards uh, this week and, and, and next. It has helped us think about threats and risks um, and indeed expectations of all, all stakeholders. Um, and that has been really, really important in changing the way that we think about education and thinking about what it is that we do uh, in education. Um, it has made us look at our existing policies and procedures and has encouraged us, required us to, to put in place new policies and procedures, not just the emergency regulations, um, but new regulations moving forward. Because as we, we went into the stark situation with, with COVID-19, it, it really held up a mirror to what we were, were doing in, in, in higher education and made us ask some, some fairly uh, tough questions about why we were doing some of the things that we had done forever so it helped us innovate it pushed us to to innovate it helped us to to move that uh resistance to change uh, a, a little bit um so interesting times there is of course kickback against that change and and staff have across the world 
have been academic staff and administrative staff and technical staff in in education have been put under tremendous stress horrendous stress um we've all been working longer hours i'm sure uh i i certainly find that uh although i'm, I'm saving my commute to work that i'm putting extra hours in uh, in my little office here um and um, so it's it's an intriguing and something we need to to think very carefully about. We need to think about the the, the health and well being uh, of everyone that's involved in in, in education. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it, it's also been really really important as people have been distanced and as we we've changed our social interaction to to ensure clear and an inclusive communication so that everybody feels part of the the uh, solution moving forward. So what does this mean for, for, for value? Where do we start to think about things? So students have an expectation. They, they, they sign up to go to, to, to university. They sign up to go to college. They sign up to go to schools. And there's a something about going to lectures, about going to labs, about going to practicals, about going to seminars, meeting tutors, meeting peers, all of those things. They are part of that, that, that student experience. So... What do we do when the whole thing changes? When, when all of that activity we can't do, how do we ensure that that value for money? Well, we can do. We can put some things online. We can put different processes in place. We can change what it is that the the, the whole concept of education is about. But is that the, the uh, is that giving value value for money? And uh, it's and and you know we, we, it's something that we'll be looking at as we we go through this and move through this. Uh, uh, situation linked in with that is the um, as we move into online delivery and blended learning and hybrid learning and, and distance learning the, the 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 time we've got to develop materials and the the quality of those materials um starts to become a, a really interesting thing to to look at this is where i go back to millennials when i started playing computer games um I thought Tetris was very cool. Space Invaders was just tremendous. Um, I, I show it to my, my, my kids now. And they go, Dad, what is that? They're sitting playing on Assassin's Creed. They're playing FIFA. And, you know, it is, it's film quality uh, output. They expect that in education. That's, you know, a real issue because we, we haven't got the infrastructure. We haven't got the finances. We haven't got the time. We haven't got the expertise to to uh, to to produce that 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 quality of, of material. So there's a question there about about value for money. They buy a game for forgive me. I can't remember what it is in ringgits, but for 50 pounds sterling. Um, and so, you know, they, they, that they think, wow, this is great. And they expect education to be like that. Really, really prob problematic. So that that quality question is a, is is, a, is an issue, and we need to make sure that we have pedagogic infrastructure in place to to ensure that our students get that that quality of learning. There's also a situation that the, I mentioned the stresses on staff, and uh, you know we need to take time off. We need to have a break. We need to have weekends. We need to have holidays. Um, and it's difficult to do that. Really early on in, 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 in COVID-19 and lockdown, um, many of my staff said they, they were almost addicted to being online. They didn't want to miss anything. And, you know, you might say, well, that's great. <laughs> They're there all the time. But on the other hand, as a, as a caring manager, as a caring leader, um, I'm very worried about that. I'm very worried about their, 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 their well-being. As we go into the expectation about high quality materials, we need to give staff the the, the, the tools and the time to, to develop those, um, as well as the the, uh, the, uh, the 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 expertise to develop the, the materials. So it's very different putting a few bullet points on a PowerPoint to creating um, a, an all inclusive and all embracing learning environment. The other thing that we need to take into account is that there are a whole lot of, of people that uh, and a whole lot of organizations that have developed uh, materials you know, for, for platforms to use, but also guides on how to do things um, and, you know, teasing those out and working out which are the best ones to use in itself is, a, is, a, is an interesting challenge. Um, 
So as we move forward, uh, as we come out of this, and, and I, I, I hope that this will stop soon. Uh, I, it, I just hope it will stop soon. Um, I hope there's going to be a vaccine. I hope we, we find a, a, a way to, to deal with this so we can get back to some kind of normality. I don't think we'll go back to where we were at this time last year. And the new normal will be something that, that uh, comes into, into play. We need to learn the lessons. We've responded. We're recovering and we need to review. Um, think about what we've learned from the pro process of no detriment, for, for example. And a fascinating thing to, to, to uh, pick up uh, as we move forward. Thinking about blended learning and hybrid learning and, and how students uh, learn, learn and want to learn. Thinking about how we, we bring in something I've been advocating and pushing for for a number of years um, in my, my schools and faculty is looking at how we flip the classroom, how we use problem-based learning, how we move away from the, the, the traditional lecture seminar type of, of uh, uh, situation. So we can look at how we restructure education so it's to, to the benefit of, of, of everyone. We think about the pedagogy, we think about how people learn, we think about all the aspects of of learning from a teacher's perspective, from a lecturer's perspective, from a, a student's perspective, and from an assessor's perspective. So there's a lasting legacy, and that, that I'm, I remain convinced that there is a silver lining in all this horrible uh, situation, particularly in education, as we move forward and embrace technology, embrace new ways to, to uh, provide education uh, and uh, provide value for money. So, student <laughs> student expectations. I'm very conscious of of time, and thank you for staying with me so so far. So, students are creative, they're adaptive, they're resourceful, they're business like, they're very very switched on. They they uh, I have a student uh, a student. I have a son. My eldest son is going off to university uh, a week on Saturday. I'm heartbroken as a parent, but I'm delighted for him. It's it's just so fantastic and exciting a, a time for him. But the way that he's uh, engaging with uh, higher education is very, very different to what the opportunities uh, for me were many moons ago when I was when I was leaving home. So that 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 the student body, the student expectation has has changed. The in the UK there is a cost to education. Um, the, you know, there's a, a a hefty student fee every year. There's the the cost of accommodation. There's the cost of living. Um, so students are going into debt. And they want to make sure that as they go into that debt, the the uh, the, the, the it's it's worthwhile. It's, it's a debt worth taking on. And I'll come back to to employability just in a second. But it's linked very carefully uh, and clearly to to employability. Technology, as we deal with COVID, as we deal with the student expectation, as we deal with the the uh, the, the value that the the uh, millennials expect, uh, it's important that we we utilise technology appropriately. We need to make sure that there's the access to education for all in a in a safe and secure uh, way that will enable students to learn the way they want to learn. They will get high quality materials, high guidance, high uh, and clear structures to to move the way through their, their, their education. Remembering that these students think very very differently cope with multiple uh, inputs, they do these very uh, different time frames about how they how they think. So it's something that we need to, to take into account and indeed something that we've learned in dealing with COVID-19. So the value added, um, you know, wh where does that, that go? Um, so, the, the, you know, a degree is a, a degree. Uh, it is a standard, it's a benchmark, it's something that employers understand, it's something that is a tremendous achievement for, for students and is a, a, a real marker about the, the qualities uh, that they have in terms of their the thinking and their abilities, but also in the, in the skill set that they, that they have. They're developing skills for life. Uh, indeed, um, it's learning about how to learn is perhaps the, the most important uh, skill for, 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 for students and one of the important things that we, we push things through, as well as, of course, the, the, the subject uh, matter that we, we uh, uh, work with our students uh, to, to develop their understanding of. Linked in with that is, is employability. 
and students want to be able to get a, a job at the end of the, of the day. Now that that whole employment environment is is shifting radically. There's you know horrendous situations with uh, uh, businesses not being able to to keep uh, people on, on, on the books. But as we get out of this, you know, the, 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 there are going to be new jobs and different jobs, jobs that we don't even know exist yet. Um, and it's important that we enable the, the our, our students to identify and work in, in, in these areas so that they are able to take traditional jobs on, but also take new jobs on as well. And then, you know, in terms of value added, in education, what do we think about that that learning environment? We think about the resources, we think about the materials, we think about the expertise that uh, educators bring, and we think about how we we do delivery, how we engage students, how we we motivate them, how we we uh, encourage them to to live and breathe about the the, the, the subjects of uh, an issue. Uh, to to deal with their own standards and ensuring that the, the the standards of output is important. And one way to do that is through accreditation. And I go back to my uh, role uh, with the, the the my my professional body. And one of the things I'm doing at the minute is looking at the value added for of of accreditation, which is a different story for a different day. Um, it's also important as we think about education to to think about the mode and pattern of, of education and something that that uh, we've been really uh trying to push over the last few years and will continue to do so is how that students get work experience at the same time as, as they're learning through things like internships placements uh, and the like um, and also to to bring in a whole set of, of extracurricular activities. Uh, one of the things that we do is in, at Sunderland is look at how um, students from different faculties work together with things like hackathons and business challenges and uh, and the like. All very important things around uh, value value added. What does this mean as educational leaders? Well, we need to be thinking about value added. Is is the uh, is is important and is key. We need to think about the the breadth of opportunities and and make sure that the, that we ha have the uh, infrastructure uh, and structure uh, and support mechanisms to enable those opportunities to to be in, in in place. One of the things that I love about being a, a leader in education is that the opportunity to think outside the box, um, and, you know, and, and that that you know. Part of my 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 role is to to think about new opportunities, think about development, to think about how we we might be moving forward to in in the future, both in terms of what we teach and how we teach it. Um, so, a fascinating part around that value added challenge. As institutions, as in universities, we're all trying to do something different um, and create our, our unique selling points, and we need to have that in the back of our mind all the time. Um, I think it's really important that we embrace diversity and inclusivity and hopefully i've i've shown that that that, that is part of my the spirit and ethos of of the way that I, I undertake my 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 work i think it's important that um we don't just think about value added for students but we think about value added for those working in in uh, uh, education institutions um, and have a career structure and a, a, a clear support uh and development uh, and mentoring processes for for those who are starting out in their career, but also those who are moving through their their, their, their career. And one last thing uh, to 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 uh, put on that value added table, both for students and for academics, is to celebrate and reward what we do. Um, you know, obviously in the UK we're very British about things. And we tend to be a little bit modest, and perhaps we we should be be more outgoing uh, and celebrating uh, the things that, that that go well. So, what can we do as leaders in education? Well, I've I've put in front of you a whole series of of, of challenges and opportunities. Um, I think it's in in China that the, the the word for for challenge and opportunity is the same. So, as we've dealt you know, this uh, the set of of circumstances to, to to cope with then yes there are challenges but also see them as opportunities and think about how uh, we we talk about that and how we communicate that direction of travel 
I think it's really important as a uh, leader in education to think on the of the impact on students and academics and support staff. We wouldn't be leaders if we didn't have to balance the books and thinking about cost effective and workable uh, and financially sustainable and uh, effective solutions is, is part of a, a, a remit. I also think it's important to be inclusive and as I mentioned just previously, to celebrate uh, our, our successes. So forgive me for talking on a, 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 a little longer than the, than the 45 minutes. Um, as you can see, it's something that uh, I'm, I'm passionate about. The, uh, the, the strap line for, for my university is life changing. Um, and I really do believe that, that higher education is a, is a life changing opportunity for those participating in it, um, but also for all those students engaging, engaging with us. So thank you very much. Thank you for your patience. Um, and I'm very happy to take any questions uh, as we move forward. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Professor Alistair, for that very insightful presentation. Now, uh, after listening to you, I'm sure we are all convinced that educational leadership does play a very significant role in adding value to students' learning. Now, uh, Professor, we have a few questions here. And the first question is, some of the demands from the stakeholders, especially parents, are unreasonable. Now, how do you address this issue? <laughs> well, that's a really good question. Given that I am now a parent going into higher education, um, and it's <laughs> so it's been really interesting seeing it from a from the parental perspective. Um, we we've all I have personally have always uh, understood and, and realised that uh, as as a parent, then you're, you're thinking about your, your your child's education, your child's. Uh, well-being and, and the opportunities afforded to 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 your, your your kids, and you think about what it means for them. It thinks about how it is in terms of uh, de developing their their life skills, but also in terms of what it means for their their their, their career moving moving forward. Um, so it's really important to to talk with parents. We uh, um, in our, our open days, we invite parents to to come in. And speak with us. Um, I usually let the students go away and and talk with other, uh, you know, the prospective students go and talk with with existing students and find out what it's really like. And I talk to the parents about the the questions that they they are concerned about. And it's everything from the accommodation to the, what a a day in the life would, would be like uh, around. And then thinking about okay, they they're investing a whole lot of money uh, in 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 the kids. What's it going to mean for them? So I, I use statistics, I use metrics, I use our employability data, I use our national student survey data to uh, show and explain to them what it what it means that they, they, they're investing in. There's some really interesting data around the the, the, the payback um, in terms of salary, and and you know, of course, there are some people who don't go to university who make a fortune. Of course, there are, um, but you look at that uh, in, in investment. Uh, against earnings and on average by the time a student who, who comes into university at 18 graduates at 21 by the time they're in their late 20s their overall earnings have surpassed those who haven't gone through university so you know looking at financial metrics is a is a, is a way to to uh square the circle with with, with parents all right that is a very evidence-based response to parents now, uh, Professor, we have another question. Uh, the new norm has also created resistance to change. Now, what are your suggestions to convince the academic staff of the need to change? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a really, 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 really good point. Um, the, and it, it breaks down into a number of phases. So as we went into lockdown in March, the, uh, there was a, a kind of call to arms and a rallying round and and everybody was really interested in in ensuring that our the students that were already there got through the system um they were they either graduated or they, they were progressed into uh, the, 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 the the subsequent years um and it was fantastic effort um 
we do as leaders recognize and realize that you know people went beyond the beyond the contractual obligations um and that, that was you know a, a, an interesting thing to to think about and how we reward that and how we 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 uh, 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 you know like take that into account as we move forward into a, a, a situation where we think about the health and safety and health and well-being if anybody was doing face-to-face -face teaching but we also think about the demands if we so take something as simple if you've got a class of 50 students um and you are running uh lab sessions in, in my discipline so we can put 25 students in a lab so you run that lab twice if we in, invoke social distancing um and whatever the social distancing rules are they seem to be changing but you might have to run that lab 10 times rather than two times so what does that mean in terms of workload what does that mean in terms of contact time and so the the the, the whole workload model has to to evolve and change and, and develop so that you know it's, it's ridiculous to to expect uh academics to just work five times more than you did previously you know so you need to take into account what that looks like what the timetable looks like what the contact looks like think about different models about how we we in, engage with, with with students so that um you know academics are you know they, they, they've got that work-life balance there is undoubtedly uh a different set of skills that need to be to be developed so you know you need to have that support structure there to to help you know people with with new technologies um you know i i i knew Streamyard until today um you know and i'm very grateful for your technical staff guiding me through and, and helping me uh, into this so we need to exacerbate that and and, and expand that for our, our, our academic colleagues so a whole set of things be very cognizant of the workload be very cognizant of the demands be very cognizant of the the, the health and well-being and support for new pedagogies and new technologies all right, uh, next question, Professor. Uh, time is always an issue in ensuring materials are of quality and appropriate value is given to students. Now, how yeah. can we manage time effectively? <laughs> I, I wish I knew. <laughs> I wish I had that magic wand. Um, the, I think we need to be very, very clear about what it is that we're, we're, we're doing. I think we as leaders need to recognize the expectations around the time to, to prepare materials to be of the quality that our students expect and that value for money. Um, we need to have this space. So, for example, my institution, we employed a, 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 t a new team of education developers who are a central resource, who are there to help and support our our academics in terms of storyboarding in terms of you know technical uh, development in terms of uh, pedagogic uh, development and, and and understanding things that work so that people aren't left uh, in in the cold so there's a staff development access uh, uh, part to, to 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 the answer there's the the support part to the answer and there's the expectation part around what it is that we're we're able to to to, to deliver to students and to be fair, students are excellent. Students are really, really, uh, I mentioned about them being creative and adaptive and and, and, and understanding. Um, we have a, a, a thing in the UK called the National Student Survey. Um, and we were all petrified, to be honest, about how, you know, because the, the survey was right smack bang in the, in, in the middle of, of lockdown. And we thought students would react negatively. But actually the students reacted really, really positively and they appreciated and understood the efforts that academic colleagues had had put in place um and you know they they, they, they uh scored things uh, accordingly so actually our national student survey results have, have improved in lockdown and that's maybe something that we can take away and 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 learn learn from all right professor our last question it's about employability now, employability has always been a dominant graduate attribute or what value do you think is the most important aspect in ensuring employability so there are a number of things so obviously the subject expertise 
and you know the the the, the, the higher qualification you get at the highest like uh, level of award then then great that's that's part of it but i think there are there are a number of things that we certainly embed in our in our programs at Sunderland and and, the, and uh, across the UK, and it's uh, about communication, and it's about you know written communication, verbal communication, um, it's about uh, group working, being able to work with uh, a series of diverse uh, people um, across different disciplines with, with different expectations, with different skill sets. It's about problem solving. And ensuring that you're and being able to show that you can can do problems uh, and and so on. so one of the things that we have in our, uh, in, our in our undergraduate structures is, is the final year a third of it is given over to uh, a project so students can go to employers and say look here's a big problem that I I have solved yeah and it's a really really really, really important thing and then the fourth bit um, is is around confidence um, and you know that having somebody who's prepared to come into an organization and be confident enough to ask tough questions you know why why, why are you doing things this way you know wh what's going on so they're they're things that you're as well as the subject expertise uh, a set of soft skills that that, that our, our our graduates develop uh in in, the, in their time uh as when they're studying all right um Thank you, Professor. It looks like uh, that was our last question. Now, with that, we have come to the end of the session for today. And uh, But before I move on, allow me to highlight the key points from today's session. Now, it's obvious that educational leadership must embrace diversity and inclusivity. Students have their own expectations and must be catered to leaders in education, they must embrace challenges and opportunities. Leaders also must consider the impact of change on students, academics, and support staff. Also, there is a need to ensure cost-effective and workable solutions. And lastly, but not the least, the importance of celebrating successes. Now, these are the key points from today's session. Uh, thank you once again, Professor Alistair Irons, for your time and for sharing with us your ideas on the topic of educational, educational leadership and value for money for students. Without doubt, everyone out there has benefited and enjoyed your presentation. Now, ladies and gentlemen, our next session will be on the 15th of September at 9 a.m. local time on the topic of teachers professional development through principles instructional supervision do join us for this session well ladies and gentlemen with that i thank you once again and see you soon i hand over to dr ghazali a big thank you to mr s Murphy, our moderator for the patient Many thanks also to our esteemed speaker today, Professor Alistair Irons. Thank you again to all participants for watching and uh, participating in Comat today. I'm pleased to share that currently today we have managed to hit more than 57 countries of our participants who had registered for this Comat IPG today. Once again, before we end, thank you very much for all the comments and views given to us throughout this session and also many thanks also to viewers who have written positive comments on FC Command IPG today. Command IPG 2020 will continue with more to the speakers. Make sure to stay tuned with us until the end of this official call. Until we meet again in the next session, I'm Ghazali I would like to thank you for your utmost and continuous support. Keep watching Command IPG KPA. Terima kasih and jumpa lagi.